Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dragan Diviak. I'm coming from Faculty of uh, Geodesy in uh, Zagreb. Uh, this presentation will give you some overview of the project that uh, we did for the city of Zagreb uh, this year, where we uh, evaluated, evaluated the current status of the compliance of the Zagreb spatial data infrastructure with the inspired requirements. So this is the overview of the project scope. The, so in the first work package, we have to, as I said, uh, evaluate the current compliant uh, with Inspire in four uh, topics. Then uh, we uh, propose the new metadata system. And in the end, we uh, showed how the one data set uh, harmonized with Inspire requirements would look like in the case of the spatial plan uh, for the city of Zagreb. Uh, so, a little bit of the ZIP, uh, this is acronym of the Spatial Data Infrastructure of the City of Zagreb. Uh, this is the usual structure of the hierarch hierarchical levels of the spatial data infrastructures. So on top we have the like uh, Inspire as the European Spatial Data Infrastructure that consists of uh, national spatial data infrastructures that again consists of the data set or the stakeholders that are publishing data sets uh, that are responsible for. And uh, in Croatia, uh, our national infrastructure is called NIP. Uh, ZIP has the uh, Zagreb uh, Spatial Data Infrastructure is it has a, a different, a bit different. Uh, it, it, it is unique in a way that uh, the city of Zagreb has uh, many uh, different areas that has to cover. Uh, it consists of uh, different uh, departments, and uh, each department has its own uh, representative in the ZIP coordination body. That is a formal body that uh, make all the decisions uh, for the development of the ZIP. Uh, another, um, let's say, unique or maybe particular uh, thing that uh, is uh, unique to the city of Zagreb infrastructure is this, that each of the departments depends on the agency for technical support, so they don't have their own uh, technical capacity to develop anything, so all the work is being outsourced to the APIs uh, that supports the infrastructure. So coming back to this uh, evaluation, uh, first uh, module was uh, evaluation of the current status of the ZIP registry. So the registry dates uh, in from uh, 2014. Uh, well, actually, it's not the registry, maybe as uh, you all know. It's uh, more uh, like uh, some list of the data sources that exist in the different departments. So it's like a first step in creating of metadata just uh, to uh, make, make uh, the people who, who, who are having some data sets in their department aware that they need to report those data sets to give some basic information and then later on from this uh, information create metadata. So uh, at the beginning of the project, we, the, the register had uh, 29 data sources and we uh, contacted all the people from depart different departments, inspected the geo portal uh, that uh, had consisted of many more uh, layers than the data sources are uh, reported. So this was like a first, uh, uh, first uh, finding that, uh, that all the, the, the the, the departments should uh, a bit more describe and report those layers in the registry. Uh, so we have the, the let's say, the, the list of the, what actually uh, exists in the city of Zagreb. And the second uh, module was, uh, was uh, some evaluation of the current status of the metadata. So the metadata profile was uh, defined in 2009. Uh, and it actually it uh, preceded the national metadata profile and there was some difference in the metadata elements and uh, the question was is there any 
uh, actual need to have the unique profile that uh, consequently requires some uh, more complicated uh, implementation. So we discussed that with the uh, zip coordination and decided that uh, maybe the best way would be just to adapt the national uh, metadata profile and uh, stick with it. Uh, the metadata catalog was also built at that 10 years ago uh, technology. Uh, the, the metadata elements and the values are also uh, available online, but the problem was that uh, this catalog was not built on some uh, catalog service uh, application server, but uh, it was a custom developed uh, .NET application uh, that actually was a bit, a, a little outdated. So uh, the, the recommendation was just to implement the new uh, application server or that will serve the metadata records so the national metadata catalog could harvest all the records directly and there will be no need for duplication of effort of creating metadata into uh, catalogs. Uh, the third module was actually the, the real uh, work of creating the Inspire uh, data set uh, for the spatial plan of city of Zagreb. Uh, so it was identified that uh, the, this data set, that that, that 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 data set should be mapped to the uh, application schema plant land use from the land use data specifications. And uh, actually, the question was okay. So how should how, how can we create this data set? They gave uh, some shape files uh, that that uh, they used for the uh, for the presentation of the sp uh, spatial plan. It consisted of uh, four shape files, and uh, so this is the the UML model of the plant land use uh, application schema that consists of three feature uh, types that are spatial and one official documentation that is not. Uh, so we use the schema matching tables and uh, in, uh, in communication with the expert uh, domain, uh, domain experts uh, from the city of Zagreb, we made this schema mapping table, so match the attributes and the values from the shape files with uh, the uh, outcome with the data model of uh, the application schema and uh, made the, this mapping of the Helux length use uh, values to the feature class zoning element, uh, create the procedure for uh, schema transformation in uh, HAIL and produced Gmail file that uh, complies with uh, Inspire specification. It has all these features, uh, linking uh, feature objects uh, uh, and uh, this uh, X-linked reference to the values from the Inspire uh, registry. And uh, once we produced that, presented that, uh, then some questions arise. So, these are the questions. What should we do with this GML file? How can we use? Uh, do we need to create new GML file each time when we produce new plan? Uh, are we legally obliged to comply with uh, Inspire? And uh, many more. So the questions were, well, answers uh, what were as follow. Uh, this GML file is, uh, let's say, uh, easy to transform to the download service, so fulfill this obligation. Uh, Hail as an application uh, also uh, offers the possibility to create an XML file that will uh, create Atom uh, Fit RSS, so publishing online the GML file together with this uh, RSS uh, feed. Uh, you will fulfill the obligation of the uh, providing download service. Then, how can we use it? Question. Uh, okay, it's a text file, GML, can we work with it? So, yes, we presented, you can just open it in the 
QGIS software. And this is the symbology that uh, is uh, specified by the specification with the SLD. Uh, it doesn't look it doesn't look very nice from the cartographic uh, perspective. And uh, the main question was, but uh, these data are doesn't bring any additional value, then we have it. So. Uh, people had to realize that this is not something that they uh, create for themselves. So the original shape files has, are much more maybe richer in the attribute in the values, but uh, the Inspire uh, data set is uh, well documented uh, with the specification and someone who will use that will much quicker understand the data that they own than uh, just inspecting the data sets itself. Because uh, one of the findings of the, the study was that uh, data, existing data didn't have a proper documentation. So it was in case that some user needed some further information that they would need to contact uh, the responsible uh, department. Uh, then the following question was, okay, so when we make a new spatial plan, do we have to, to recreate everything again? Uh, the answer is simple. So once you create this data schema, um, schema uh, matching and uh, transformation in uh, Hale, you can reuse it by uh, uh, each time that you create the same uh, shape files, and you will get uh, the new GML data set that can that is ready to use for the the new issue of the spatial plan. And uh, final question is, uh, do we really need to do this? Is it, are we legally obliged to comply with Inspire? And the question is simple, yes, you have. Uh, but don't look at it as an uh, enforcement of do, to doing something that uh, make you just additional work. So try to, uh, to see it as uh, work that uh, you are doing for your users. Uh, that will be uh, much easier. Uh, that could that, that will be able to use your data much easier and uh, in a much more convenient way. And in the end, so what we realized uh, during the project uh, is that uh, that uh, neither the thematic expert nor the some uh, technical expert cannot uh, fulfill this uh, producing of the quality uh, data set. Uh, by themselves, so the cooperation is uh, mandatory. Uh, there is still not clear motivation for data owners, so what I previously said about uh, doing something for the data users was uh, not so eagerly accepted, but okay, they realize they have to do that. And then the, in the end, uh, the thing about financing, the, in the end it, there need to be also some uh, good motivation for decision maker who are financing all that. So this is like a crucial step in uh, for the development of the space, uh, spatial data infrastructure of the city of Zagreb. Thank you, that's it. Uh, Luka Jovic from GDI Skopje. Uh, I have a question regarding the validation. So did you perform any formal validation of the transformed data set? Uh, well, actually, not yet, because at that moment, uh, when we produce this GML file, the current uh, Inspire validator supported only the data teams uh, for the Annex 1. But uh, as we saw yesterday, uh, I think that uh, the data teams from Annex 2 and 3 are now implemented in validator, so we'll check it. Good morning, uh, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to this session. I really appreciate that you, um, well, you selected the session. And this is a part, um, the, the story, which is a little bit different from probably other presentations. We will try uh, to present how we can link Inspire with uh, the geo education in a nice way, funny way just to have a pleasure, to have a series, to have a research in that, but also, first of all, fun. 
The presentation was prepared together, um, we pre prepared it together with Professor Hanks Holten and Eduardo Diaz, who is sitting with us. Uh, Hank uh, and Eduardo, they are affiliated, both affiliated to V and uh, Giordan in Holland. And I have a, a pleasure to represent the Grid Warsaw Center, which is located in Poland. And we are working, that's an organization working in partnership with the UN Environment. Now you know why we are so much focused on the uh, environmental education. Um, so, um, the question is, how can we use INSPIRE to build an interesting modern approach to education? While working on this presentation, I was started to think, how was it when I was a kid? Uh, maybe the, I'm not that old as the picture is, but still, uh, we were spending so much time in the field. We were going out, we were observing the nature, we were collecting some information, uh, not data that time, but just making some drawings, even not pictures. But there was something, so we were in touch with the nature, with, uh, we, we were working in teams and collecting everything. Uh, bringing that, that was our knowledge and that was our approach to get the, to, let's say, the additional education than to the education we were getting at schools. Then we got a Rubik's Cube, which was a logic puzzle, which focused our, our attention for years. That was really fascinating to work with this cube. So there was uh, uh, in a school, at home, but also outside. And finally, we have games. Kids, uh, with the end of the 20th century, kids got games. SimCity, Tetris, and finally, Minecraft. What is Minecraft? I'm sure that uh, many of you know. This is a video game created in 2011 by a Swedish guy, uh, Markus Persson, um, later developed by Mo Mojang? Mojang, that's a company. Uh, the game allows players to build with a variety of different blocks in a 3D generated world, requiring creativity from players. Is there anyone who knows the game? Okay, now <laughs> I understand that you know what I'm talking about. Um, well, there, by early 2018, uh, over 144 million copies had been sold across all platforms. So that's a really a huge amount and means that this, with this approach, we could have access to those, let's say, 100 million of people playing with Minecraft. And now we have Inspire on the other side. So just to, before we go further to find out the connection, Inspire, you know, I do not have to present the topic. So on a completely, completely different world, serious research, uh, national mapping ag agencies, standards, directive, and so on. So how to find the connection? Before I go into details, let me start with a short explanation about the relation between Minecraft and EcoCraft, which was, which was in the title. So Minecraft, you know, 144 million copies sold. Um, GeoCraft. Uh, GeoCraft is, um, is, uh, was developed by Geodan. I don't know when, Eduardo, but that was like five years ago, six years ago. And... Um, the main goal was to support spatial education um, and so-called public participation. Then the next step was a eco-craft, so how to use the developments from geocraft for environmental education and also the energy as a, let's say, subset of uh, eco-craft. Uh, spatial uh, education with the Minecraft, within the Minecraft environment, which is based on real data. To understand this better, let's have a look at the short video. Hope it works. These are blocks. This but now you are getting another environment. So this is the environment which was built in GeoCraft. Spatial data were imported into the Minecraft environment open to kids, to improve the world around, to have fun, to focus on the local issues, local challenges, and these are the results. 
due to the shortage of time, I will stop right now because there are many, many more examples. After the session, you can uh, uh, look at the full movie. So just quickly, how it was done, the geography recipe. So first of all, we have, we we relate or we work with the real data. Data called uh, elevation, land use, and buildings. They are converted and imported into the Minecraft environment. Easy? Yes, easy. <laughs> I'm proud to say that there is not only the whole Holland available in Geocraft right now, but also the whole Warsaw with uh, its 3D buildings and streets. And we start the excursion with our Polish kids as well. Uh, it was in Napoli, spring 2016, around 20 top-level scientists discussing the issues related to cities' development. Very serious meeting. ABC research. Serious people, serious discussions. Can you imagine my, my surprise when uh, Professor Hanks Holton came to the stage and started to talk about geocraft? How can we use this uh, environment to educate, to increase the spatial education, to involve kids in a public participation, and to support the creation of a better world? Talking about its power in supporting the spatial education, I thought that why not to use it for environmental education? Why not to support, why not to use this uh, possibility of having, let's say, hundreds of thousand kids involved to have a better environmental education. Then we started to discuss this concept of eco-craft. So environmental scenarios, geospatial data, citizen science in gaming infrastructure, those three pillars for, of, these are the three pillars of eco-craft. Eco-craft and inspire. What are the opportunities? What are the, what are the challenges? And uh, we decided to start with a research question. How do we get young people to participate in the renewable, a renewable energy planning process? To answer this question, the first scenario on the renewable energy was developed by Geodan. Uh, there are several components, spatial data, scenario and scoring, modeling parameters. So I will go quite quickly because that's, uh, the time is running. Inspire and EcoCraft. This is a very simple slide, just a very simple presentation of how, we, how Inspire supports the development of this game. We are getting data from different annexes. We are uh, transforming, like we are linking those data with some external thematic uh, data and information. So to have a um, bigger selection of attributes. And we need harmonized harmonize data because uh, this is not only an approach for one country or one city, but it must be easily implemented in many places. So having access to a harmonized data prepared with in the same structure makes life much easier. The quite important is the link to some external uh, thematic data. The uh, game design and the storing uh, and the proper scoring are crucial for keeping the attention of players. So we focused quite a lot, uh, quite seriously, we were seriously thinking, and we were working also with an external researcher who came with the uh, model, who brought the parameters, and the, uh, finally, I'm, I'm hoping to show you the EcoCraft as it works, as it looks right now. So it's based on a really, uh, on a real science. Just a few print skins of the pilot version of EcoCraft. The goal is to indicate the benefits coming from the renewable energy, photovoltaic panels, insulation, or green infrastructure in the city. Player has its own budget to be spent on materials or infrastructure. There are costs in euro, CO2 reduction as a result of the investment, energy consumption reduction scoring. There is an unlimited number of educational scenarios which could be implemented in EcoCraft. They can help to understand the benefits of renewable energy, green infrastructure in the cities, energy efficiency of buildings, and many, many more. But what's extremely important for 
particularly for me, <laughs> this is the citizen science. So moving kids out of the room, um, just bringing them to the field. So go, collect the data, and bring the information into the game. Use it as a kind of an input, quite serious input in the game. I'm always stressing that this is, uh, that, uh, that, that's an extremely important part of the whole story. So, um, how can it work? This is an example, because we have, this is a typical Google um, picture, image. This is the, um, the, the image of a part of the city which was created with the use, that, that's not the 3D building, so that's not, not the very detailed model, but this is a topo topographic data, just you know, converted into the Minecraft environment, and we selected wild, one building which in reality looks like this. So we asked our kids, go there, look at this building, think uh, what you can change and how you could change this building and surrounding and what you, how you can change its energy efficiency. So this type of idea uh, was created. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to uh, inform you that the concept of EcoCraft was also um, well received by the UN environment. On 23rd of June 2018, a memorandum of understanding was signed between UN Environment and EduKeys Foundation in Holland. And agreed Warsaw as a center working in partnership with UN Environment is involved in the development and the promotion of the whole concept. I'm coming to the end, but there is a short movie at the end, so. Uh, the conclusions. We believe uh, that with the use of gaming environment, especially environment of such popular game as Minecraft, we can make a change. We can bring a change. EcoCraft will help young people to better understand the complexity of the world they are living in, to collaborate, speak up, act for positive change. The ideas of EcoCraft and EduHis educational principles combine fun with the scientific investigation. They are an answer to the demand for engaging methods necessary for acquiring all the SDGs related competencies um, the children would need to meet the future challenges. They have a potential to become a greatest tool in meeting the educational objectives for the next generation. That's what we believe in, to build more sustainable cities by involved citizens. This is uh, my city, the city of the dream, with the uh, green uh, palace of culture. So that's not taken from the uh, EcoCraft, neither Minecraft, but this is an example that we can have different ideas and we can have different dreams. One of our dreams, my organization, was to have the palace of culture in green. <laughs> so while working on EcoCraft, we thought that's why not to start with that. So now it's time for a movie. Uh, so I'm inviting you to the EcoCraft world. There is no sound uh, because this is a demo. So that's not a working product. We are working on that and we hope to bring it uh, quite soon. Not to the market, but to, the, uh, to kids and to, to, the, to all people involved in the education. Um, Eduardo? Come, help me with the explanation of the movie. Okay, so for those of you familiar with uh, Minecraft, this looks very familiar. So this was generated by, um, by a computer script. We, we, instead of the kids making each block, uh, automatically we generate this world. So this is a, a region in uh, Amsterdam Southeast. And then they fly to a certain neighborhood where they're interested and they get a certain budget, you see there on the left. So budget left, they have 10,000 euros to spend, and they're going to start doing uh, activities. So they're going to place a solar panel, and they guess, oh, I've already spent 140 euros of my budget, and I'm able to produce so much energy. So the, the idea is that the game it gives uh, direct feedback. So you put something, and then it gives feedback. The interesting thing is that he's very geo-aware, so he goes now to the other side of the building. He puts the same solar panel, but he gets more energy, because he's now facing more south. So the idea is that the kids will then be aware of these uh, uh, parameters. 
So this is, was for the energy, so he, he can choose to spend all his budder, budget on solar panels, but that might, might not be the most efficient. You can see, oh, I also have to uh, reduce uh, gas uh, consumption, so yeah, I'm going to try to insulate. So he places now a wool, so an insulation material, and automatically the whole house gets insulated, so he doesn't have to do piece by piece. But he spends a lot of his budget on insulating this house. Um, and then he, he has many other, um, so he can do the insulation, the, the uh, solar panels, and then he can also do uh, windmills, he can also place windmills. So he can actually build his own windmill, so this is the idea of this, Cur currently there's a very big uh, focus on um, urban windmills, so they're smaller windmills, so a pers person can put on his on his yard, so he can build it himself, this is a, a colleague of mine playing, he's very fast, so usually it <laughs> goes slower, and then he can uh, run the eco-craft analysis uh, turbines. And then he press enter, and then he sees how much um, energy he has been pr produced. So uh, the height of the wind turbine, the diameter, and how much, how much it has cost, and how much energy it produces per year. Or if he wants, he can join with many people and build one of the very, very big wind turbines. And then, um, and then he, he gives the command, somebody builds it for them, and it's a 100 meters uh, wind turbine that's much more costly, but then it produces also much more energy. So this is the idea that they can play with different uh, scenarios, different um, uh, options, so that you, you understand how complex it is. It's not just one option is good for all. Let's put solar panels everywhere. That's not the best option sometimes. It really depends on the topography, on the geography of the place. Thank you. Hello, a nice presentation. Thank you. It's a great Thank idea. You. Um, Ray Bo Raymond Bogoslavsky from the JLC. Um, has this been tested with, t with children and have you had input from them? And what do they say? Um, energy, uh, EcoCraft, well, GeoCraft has been tested for years um, by, uh, with the Dutch kids and there are like 1,000, 100,000 people or kids playing in. Uh, so there are uh, the special educational activities in schools. Um, we are starting in Poland. Uh, we'll have the first uh, approach this uh, within even one month. So as I said, we right now we have the whole Warsaw in 3D, with quite a detailed uh, 3D. So they, they will play with the real data in that and they will, um, they will try to uh, they will be asked to understand some uh, phenomena. Um, but the EcoCraft uh, was presented in June. That was the first time when we presented uh, EcoCraft at, in June at um, a meeting uh, on livable cities. Um, the kids were playing in that. It was a little bit, uh, uh, I don't have a picture, but it, uh, I was really looking at how they uh, are, whether they ha have fun, whether that's uh, too difficult. Or, so it was a little bit difficult at the beginning, but after like three minutes, they started to understand and they started to be eager to collect, uh, to let's say to spend, to, to look at the budget they are spending and the number of CO2 uh, emissions because, well, that, this is the education. So the, this is not only fun, but this is the education through the fund. So we tested that and we have some first um, experience with, and so now we know how to improve, of course. Good morning, everyone. Um, a completely other topic, um, the same idea, improving the world and uh, making things better, but in a whole other domain. I will be talking today about uh, HIPOT and about the um, innovation we are um, currently uh, doing to making HIPOT a better platform and to improve collaboration between all different parties involved. So, the first question, what is HIPOT? HIPOT is a generic information platform on the public domain which gathers all information about the planned roadworks, planned events um, and planned hindrance on the public domain. And the whole idea is to enforce or to um, facilitate the coordination between all the different parties, all the different utility companies, 
all the cities, um, but also just citizens asking for a permit to organize some party. Um, and to coordinate all that and to limit the hindrance <clears throat> and increase um, coordination between those roadmarks and, for instance, an event like um, a cycling race. Now, we started, and this is in uh, um, the decree, we started in 2010, first of all, with uh, free collaboration. So, um, the whole idea of the platform was we will um, optimize the information flows um, from the process of the planned uh, occupancy of the public road. So we have a, a city that will plan a bike race and we would have a utility company that will plan to have some, um, some roadworks planned. And before HIPOT, uh, we really had the uh, situation that all of a sudden there was a bike race and they were racing at 40 or 50 kilometers an hour and they would enter into a road where there was a road work and the whole, um, the whole race would have to stop. So in order to avoid that, we would have one platform where all the information was, get, um, was together. Um, What we see now is that um, we started with the, um, the free use of the platform and after some parties um, were exchanging data, we had some law and the law described that the aim of the platform is to optimize the information flows in order to minimize the hindrance caused by those roadworks and those events on the uh, public domain and to minimize the hindrance for road users and the society as a whole. Now, um, the decree was um, <clears throat> from 2012, 2013, um, and what we see that in the, in the beginning we had the focus on um, synergy, on like if one utility company would have a road work, they would work together and would look at other companies, like if you have electricity cable and you have another communication cable that you would not open the roads over and over again, but you, that you would do it together, um, which is cost efficient for the utilities companies, but also um, for the road users that they don't have to um, like a, a diversion one month and then they can pass the road and then two months later they have another diversion. So that was really the focus at the beginning of the platform. And now we see that more and more the, um, the aim or the, what they want from the platform is the focus on hindrance. And because it's very well that you coordinate all your road works and, um, but the whole idea is to minimize the hindrance for, um, for your companies, for your citizens, for your society. Um, and what we see is that the reuse of the information is more focused on the hindrance because just ordinary citizens or uh, GPS um, companies, they're not really interested in the road work because the road work is just a thing that's happening. But what's more important is the hindrance that's uh, caused by those roadworks or those events. So together with all our uh, users, we, we saw those developments uh, and the current system was not really ready to support those developments. And together with all our, all our uh, stakeholders, we started an analysis and we started to think like, okay, what's the aim of the platform? Where do we want to go to and how can we do this in close collaboration with all the parties involved? Um, so, um, what's important is that we plan or we aim with Hippo, to, with Hippo to be an authentic source. Now, if you talk about authentic source, there are two important uh, authentic source for everything which is planned usage of the public domain and plant hindrance. I'll come back to that later. Um, but it's important that we, um, everything which is planned, everything that you can know before, that you can go to the Hippot platform. Authentic source, um, because then we have uh, reuse, it's obliged to reuse the data. Um, from within the um, authentic source and you, don't, you can't ask data over and over and over again. 
And a second uh, important thing is the data quality, because more and more citizens, but also companies, are expecting, if they find some data, that the data is correct. Uh, it's no use to say that there will be some roadworks in your, um, in your city somewhere within the next nine months. Uh, you can expose that, but it has no value. The meaning has no, no value. So we need to have good quality data um, and exact quality data. So we started now on the innovation um, project, and the innovation project is focusing on the reuse and exchange of information by process optimization and simplification. Um, in Flanders, we have an, um, a policy, which is Flanders Radical Digital, um, where we really look at how the government is interacting with the citizens, with its corporations, and what kind of flows we are having at the moment and how we can um, optimize that by digitizing um, the whole collaboration and working together. So Hipot is an, is an important example of that. And I can give you an example. For instance, utility companies, they do uh, small entertainment works um, or um, they would connect houses to the electricity network or the telecom network. Um, and some of them would send all that information to the cities or to a community on a PDF. And then in the community, you have some, um, someone who is looking at the PDF and is really typing all that information into an Excel so that they can see later uh, what companies are working where. And so that's consuming a lot of time. People are really doing like monkey work in, in uh, typing all kinds of information from one system into another system. Um, so that's what we want to, um, to avoid by harmonizing um, data, by standardization, by linking information that's in the local cities to the information that's available at um, companies and by um, doing some work on, on standardization. So we really believe that can improve the data quality by co-creation. Like you cannot ask that all the information is within a utility company. They can plan their road work, but real hindrance, okay, where do you have to put your signal signs? Um, is there some special place for bikes? Um, is there a speed limit? All these kind of things. That's decided by the city. And if you want to have a global view on the hindrance, you have to link the information that's available within the cities with the information that's available at the utility companies. And that's what we um, aim to do with, uh, with the platform. By If a citizen, city is making a permit, um, we have some standardization of the data so that everything they put in the permit can be automatically linked from HIPOT and they would not have to type it over and over again, but we can just um, link it. Now, what we also want to do with that is um, support innovations. Uh, hindrance management is becoming more and more important. Um, we are not, in Gipot, we are not um, having all kinds of um, algorithms to see, okay, if I plan a road work there, then there's impact on, on this and these places, but the data in Gipot is available, it's available in a linked format, it's available in a standard format, so that it can be used in tools, in software to do those hindrance management. For instance, you have um, a road work um, near Brussels or near Antwerp, then you know that in, if you have a work in Brussels and in Antwerp, at the same time, yeah, maybe the whole of Flanders is not moving anymore. And so then you can um, collect those data. You can also look at some historical data from camera, from traffic, some real data, and then you can um, start to decide uh, what the impact will be of a planned roadwork, and you can give a better advice. Huh? So um, in order to support all those kind of innovations, we are also um, innovating our platform. The other thing is also with um, smart cities. Um, what we plan to do, we see that there is a focus on hindrance. And with Hipot, we want to collect all the information on the planned usage. 
by linking hipot with information in governments in cities, uh, like I des uh, described, so that the city, for instance, can say, okay, there is a big roadwork plant. Um, I need to buy, maybe, or I need to collect at that moment some other data, uh, floating car data, maybe data from um, cameras, GPS data, um, other sensor data, so that we can have the plant hindrance and the real um, real information and we put it together and we can give an, uh, a good view on the hindrance. Another example is in Hipot we can have all the, uh, you have a lot of parking lots within the city, so you can all, all have all your sensors. Your sensor can say, okay, there is a car now, so that place is no longer available. But in Hipot, um, for instance, you say uh, there's 20 parking lots that cannot be used because you, um, people ask to, um, to use it for a container or for other, uh, other reasons. And then you can gather that information together with real-time information and so give a good overview um, of the actual situations of available parking spots, for instance, in your city. And there are plenty more um, of, um, of innovations possible. Um, another innovation is um, we are going to a data-driven government. Uh, that's a nice word, it's a buzzword, a data-driven government. You have to do your policy based on the data you know. Um, we have a very good example of that. We have the information in Hipot on the planned roadworks. Uh, we have also another authentic source on all the available companies. Um, and what we would do is we would look at uh, Hipot data, see what kind of companies, small companies that are involved. Um, then see companies with, uh, or shops with less than 10 employees, for instance, and they would almost automatically receive um, like 2,000 euros so that they can work on some, uh, on their website or work on, on, um, on their promotion so there's less hindrance from the roadworks. The only thing they would have to do at the moment is just enter their banking account and that, that's it. If they do that, they will receive automatically um, the money, like 2,000 euros, so that they can um, have less problems with the roadworks. And that's something that's really working really well. And there's plenty of opportunities, plenty of, of possibilities um, in the next... Um, with the, the new Hippot platform. So and then I come to the last slide, linking data. Um, the real blue thing in the middle is the Hippot platform. And in the Hippot platform, we have some modules. Um, we would manage the, um, the usage, the plant usage um, of the public domain, the hindrance, all the diversions, the projects, because we have very small, um, like a connection of a utility company, but you also have the very large projects which can take four years and then you have different phases. Um, we would have a whole synergy module where a city can say, okay, I want to do some renewal of my city center within the next three to four years. And they would ask the um, utility companies who is interested to renew the infrastructure so that we can do that all, all together and we can manage that in one project. Um, of course, we have conflicts, like a citizen would ask for a permit to do, organize some, um, some party in, in, in the road, and they would like to, to block their um, environment, but maybe there's already a roadwork plant or there will be a container, so the platform will, uh, will not make decisions because that's the autonomy of the local government, but will say, okay, you have to pay attention because maybe there's already some, some other things planned. And also for the public transport that they can um, yeah, in time start to, um, to have the diversion of the bus routes and um, prevent their users. And then all the other things in the, um, around are all um, other processes, other databases, um, at the different government levels going from um, at the Flemish level, at the province, at the cities, uh, and all those data, they all have small parts of information. Um, and what we just need to do is have a standard to describe the information so that at least um, the, we have the same idea about the same word. And because um, if you have, what's hindrance? Huh? What's hindrance or what's occupancy? Um, 
So we have to have a common, what's the certain status? Eh? If I have it planned, is it really planned? Is it planned within, uh, for some it's planned when my budget is ready, for the others it's planned when there is someone really working in the ground, but when we do not talk the same language, then the reuse is not possible because I have another other idea and I need to convert it. Um, so that's what we're currently working on to have the um, yeah, common vocabulary, uh, common standards, and, we, um, and, and protocols to link all the information within the different um, within the different databases, within the different environments, so that we really can realize the only once principle. It's a nice principle, but you know, if you don't have standardization, harmonization, you just can't realize it, and people are still um, exchanging or copy-pasting the information from the one side to the other side, and as long as you do that, you will not have a good data quality, you can enforce it or try to enforce it by law, but people will not continue to copy-paste data. So we really change the base of, um, and, and the way we gather the information, um, and we are really um, convinced that it will improve our data quality, have more reuse. Because of the reuse, people will still be more interested in improving the data quality and so on. So um, That's what I wanted to say about um, I don't know if there are any questions. Thank you very much for the uh, interesting presentation. My name, uh, my name is Mark de Vries. I'm from Geonova. Um, we're also looking into uh, this, um, this, um, these possibilities. One of the issues we're looking into is um, sharing of data between um, governmental organizations and uh, private sector players. I, I, I noticed and that you were... Ex excuse me, and? Sorry? Um, you said exchanging data, and I did not understand the... Uh... Private sector players. So, yeah. basic public, public use of private sector data. I noticed that you had floating car data mm -hmm. in, uh, in your presentation. Are you, are, you, are you actually using, let's say, for instance, TomTom data or...? No, no. So, what we said is with Hippot, we have the uh, left-hand side with all the plant information. And what we want to do is to... Um, to facilitate the use of those um, floating car data or totem data together with HIPPO data. And for instance, Waze or other players um, will use HIPPO data within their applications. Um, or some cities, um, they would buy some floating car data and they, they would buy and they would use those data sets combined with our data set to have a, a situation or a view on the real hindrance. Um, but in order to be able to do that easily, we have those standards, and if all the parties have the different standard, then it's easy to integrate the information. Uh, so that's what we want to, but we stay on the left-hand side. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Are there more questions? On the previous slides, I saw there was an integration to the CLIP system. Could you just elaborate a little bit on how, what the data from the platform is used for in CLIP? Yeah, um, the slide I'm showing is the future. Uh, so um, what we see and, um, is that at, at currently there's two different systems, HIPOT and CLIP. Um, but um, what we see is that a lot of information that we want in, in HIPOT, like um, the, the time when they really start working on, on, the, on the roads, um, is actually available with the builders. And the builders are using the CLIP system. So we want to have an integration, uh, especially for builders, because they have information that we want to link into HIPOT. And we want to have an integration between the CLIP system, where they have to do their... Um, um, their demand for a plan, oh, I don't know the English term, but my colleague of CLIP is there. Um, and also for the, the public domain user, like citizens, like uh, cities, um, we want to gather the information available in CLIP, which is really short term. I want to do some um, excavation work tomorrow. And the information in HIPOT, um, which is more on, on the yeah, the collaboration and the longer term and the hindrance management. 
Um, but we see a lot of, um, of possibilities of a close integration and collaboration between those. Like, for instance, um, you could imagine, but that's my dream that I'm talking about, that eh, we have a very nice viewer of the CLIP system, an offline viewer, where they would see all their plans with all the cables and all the pipes. Um, and that would be wonderful if they're just on that viewer where they're, on the, uh, they're working, that they just can say, okay, I started with my works today, that the information is sent to the HIPOT system and then the, the city would see that automatically so they don't have to take a phone to email to say, okay, I'm planning to start um, tomorrow on the, to really, to actually start on, on the work. Eh? They could do it very easily, having already the app, having already all the information and they could do the same, saying, okay, now I stop working two clicks in an already available system, but with which gives us a lot of information um, in Hippot and then for the city. So that's what, um, what we are dreaming of and planning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, this presentation will be a nice follow-up of the previous presentation because our presentation is also about uh, exchanging data between public and private uh, parties, but we took a different approach. So it would be very nice to see what the different approaches are. Um, to start, these are my kids. They're two great kids, um, but they just can't agree upon anything, whether it's uh, what we should have for dinner or what movie we should watch. But there's one thing they do agree upon, and that's uh, that dad probably has one of the most boring jobs uh, that's out there. Uh, the uh, pan-European standardization and harmonization of data doesn't really earn me cool dad uh, points. Um, and we can fault them. Uh, I think there's no one here in this room who can claim that when they first saw Inspire, they said, well, it was uh, love at first sight. At least it was not for me. But over the years, I really warmed uh, to the idea of Inspire because if you take a look at it, Inspire is really great. Uh, data is much easier to find, uh, data is compatible, and for the most part, data is also free. And um, if we do it right, um, Inspire data is also the best breed uh, um, of data. It's data we can agree upon. But, there's always a but, uh, Inspire is not perfect. Um, Inspire takes a very long time to implement. Uh, this year we are in Antwerp, but it isn't exactly the first Inspire conference. And I'm sure there are very many conferences to follow in the uh, uh, coming years. And Inspire isn't also uh, a free lunch. It comes with some serious investments. And uh, although uh, Inspire has many themes, uh, in the end, it's only just uh, 43 themes. Uh, there's much more data out there. And most of the data comes from public uh, sources. And um, Inspire is also um, mostly about public data, and confidential data. And the system uh, we use is highly centralized. And these drawbacks make themselves feel when we tackle um, societal challenges, at least in, in the Netherlands, to name a few to uh, tackle climate change, to make sure that our built environment is prepared for more heat waves, uh, more uh, heavier uh, downpours. Uh, we need a lot of data. To um, facilitate the energy transition, we need a lot of data. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have to build uh, about one million buildings in the coming 20 years in one of the most uh, densely populated uh, areas in Europe already. And we also have a new Environmental and Planning Act. And the promise of this act is that everything will be much easier uh, to do. But in order to achieve uh, this result, we need also need a lot of data. So in short, we need all the data about buildings we can get, and we need it now. And Inspire will be a big help, but Inspire alone won't cut it. So together with uh, Cadastre, we thought, how can we tackle this problem? How can we get data much faster than we can get it uh, now? And um, we came up with some of the requirements. First of all, and I think that's the most uh, important one, we have to keep it simple, cheap, and easy to implement. Uh, another 
major uh, requirement is we want to uh, come up with a digital building dossier, but we will also want the owner to um, be in control of that data. So uh, we are uh, GDPR compliant, but also give uh, the owner of the dossier uh, confidence that uh, his data will be his and won't be shared with uh, someone who, uh, who he doesn't want to share it with. Um, and we also want to keep uh, the data decentralized, so we don't have to build uh, huge uh, data infrastructures or uh, data stores, um, which costs a lot of money. And we want to be able to include all kinds of data, whether it's a sophisticated building information model or maybe just a quick note uh, on what kind of um, um, new uh, shed you want or maybe some pictures you would like uh, to add to your uh, building dossier. Every kind of data uh, should be in there. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's standardized data or if it's proprietary data. We uh, want just uh, access to the data. Uh, and of course, we will also want to build uh, upon existing data sources like Inspire. And we also want to build an open platform. Uh, the core of our solution is really simple, just exchanging the data. But uh, we want to make it open so all the parties can uh, build um, extra services upon that data. And our st strategy is very simple. We um, built something um, really small. Um, Esther will uh, show us what we have done. And over the years, we want to grow the data sources. We want to grow functionality, partners, and a user base over time. And we think this approach um, isn't a replacement for Inspire, but we do think it's a nice complement to the Inspire initiative. And now Esther will show what we have built. Thank you, my name is Esther van Kotenikerk. I work for the Dutch Cadaster. Um, from the perspective of an owner, you want to have access um, to all relevant information about a building. And you want to have it in one place. From the moment you have an idea of your dream house, you start to collect all relevant data. As you progress in the process, um, you collect more and more data, uh, for example, uh, the as-built situation, and later on when you uh, live in your house, it's also about the uh, as-use situation. This concerns a, a, a lot of data. Uh, some data are from the government, some, and the most data are from the private parties. A big challenge uh, when you make uh, one dossier is that uh, some of the information may not uh, be available for everyone. For example, an architect um, does, not want to build, uh, does not want his building plans to be accessible for everyone. In order uh, to develop one place where you can have access to all relevant data, you will have to find a solution for this issue. Uh, that's why we have done a proof of concept with the blockchain technology. This is what we have made and how it works. Uh, the actual documents remain at the source. Only a hash is created and the hash and a location are stored in the dossier. The moment you change, uh, the, um, uh, you change something in the source document, the hash uh, is broken. If you look in the dossier, you will see uh, that the document is no longer validated. So you know that a change has occurred and you no longer have the most up-to-date document. The owner of the source document has the possibility to share the file and assign read and write permissions. For example, the owner wants the municipality to assess the building design. So he gives only access to the file with the designs, not all the in other information which is in the dossier, like, for example, contracts. And that's all we made. Uh, despite that's all we have done, there are a number of benefits. It's really simple. Um, it's very cheap comparing to a whole centralized database. Um, it's also very easy to implement. Uh, and if you like, you can start, start right away. The owner is in control uh, of the dossier and the data uh, of his building. And you can collect all t different types of data, whether it are pictures from uh, your house or it's the BIM model or contracts, all documents can be linked to the dossier. And it's also an open platform. Does it really work in practice? Honestly, it's too early to tell. 
Um, but we have spoken quite a lot of people uh, in the government and also with private parties, and they are all very enthusiastic about it, the idea. So we really like to uh, um, add other use cases together with the partners and the users. And we also want to enable market parties, market parties to elaborate their ideas at top of the building dossier. For example, uh, a self-conscious house. So in the future, a house can decide to purchase solar panels because there is a new subsidy granted for sustainability to, per se, to purchase uh, solar panels. Or the house can make an appointment for maintaining the central heating system. So in conclusion, the concept is a nice addiction to the INSPIRE framework. Um, it's the concept is widely applicable, not just for the digital buildings, dossiers only. So hopefully you get some ideas how you can apply this concept in your own work field. Thank you for your attention. It's very interesting. We have more or less similar issues in France, but uh, we don't know how to attach these different information because different stakeholders have different views on buildings. There is not the same segmentation of building, and so no common identification of building to make the link between these various information. So how, how are you dealing with this? Yeah, well, we think this is our first step. The first step is to collect all the information together. And then you can make, you see the difference between all types of data and you can uh, make better um, um, matching. Yeah, you, you can make better matching between the different types of data. One uh, of the things uh, we chose is not uh, to uh, prioritize standardization uh, beforehand because that takes a lot of time. Uh, we thought it's uh, more important to make the data accessible uh, so you can use it. Maybe uh, it takes some time to make the data compatible. But uh, by making data available, you can also see what are the most pressing issues uh, to, st to standardize. So uh, that's why we pri uh, prioritized uh, standardization in this uh, solution. Um, and that's one of the main difference with the Aspire approach. So it, it, it's not perfect, it also has its drawbacks, but uh, we think that uh, for, um, at least for these uh, uh, challenges, this solution is uh, better suited. Um, how is the, uh, yes, this is very interesting, I like it. <laughs> Uh, how is the data uh, georeferenced? How do people do a, a search for data sort of based on, on location? Yeah, it's not, uh, not yet georeferenced. Uh, um, um, that's one of the, the next steps we have to, to do with uh, the, the different parties. Uh, the digital building uh, dossiers are uh, right now just a dossier, so they are not you reference. But um, of course, we want uh, uh, you are able uh, to uh, reference inspired data. Also, uh, for example, the key registers in the Netherlands, uh, like uh, the address and building uh, registration, and those do have uh, geo references. So that's one of uh, um, the um, uh, possibilities to make these buildings geo referenced.